Hey, good morning. Good evening to you. I'm, it's good morning for me. I'm here in Berlin. Uh, but good evening to all of you in Asia. Um, Phil Baldwin, my colleague in Hong Kong, will join us shortly, uh, but you'll get to meet him again at the end of the, uh, the session. But uh, welcome to the independent audit webinar on virtual board meetings, getting them right. Slide. Uh, I'm just going to introduce uh, myself. So, uh, and uh, also just mention who Phil is. So Rem, if you could uh, move on to the next slide, please. So uh, my name is Richard Sheath. Uh, I'm the founder director of Independent Audit Limited, which was founded some 18 years ago. And uh, over those years, we've done many board evaluations. Um, and so I've got about 18 years worth of experience of board evaluations under my belt present, including for some very large uh, FTSE 100 organizations, international banks, and other types of organizations such as the, the Football Association here in the UK. Um, you can just see we've been joined by Phil Baldwin. Phil, would you like to just introduce yourself? Yes, uh, sorry about the uh, technical difficulties there. Um, thank you, Richard, and thank you for everybody joining us. Uh, I've been with uh, Independent Audit since June last year. Uh, I've been in Asia for over 30 years, and prior to joining uh, Independent Audit, I was the chief executive of a professional body in Hong Kong and China, uh, a governance professional body in China and Hong Kong. And I also, in 2010, founded an international governance organization, which now represents about 80,000 governance professionals globally. And directly before joining uh, Independent Audit, I was uh, director of a board portal and which provided paperless meeting solutions uh, to listed companies, mainly listed companies across Asia. So governance, particularly board governance, has uh, been a big part of my life for 20 years. And I'm delighted now to be sort of helping uh, independent audits uh, bring their expertise to Asia, particularly Hong Kong, and Malaysia, and Singapore. Thanks, Phil. Slide room. So just a very short introduction to independent audit so you can get an idea as to why we might be reasonably well positioned to share our experience with you about virtual board meetings. Um, in the UK, we were amongst the, the top companies involved in board evaluation. And over the years, we've done more than 350 board reviews, including around 50 or so for FTSE 100 companies. We do two types of board evaluation. One, the fullest, is based around interviews, paper review, and possibly at times the uh, observation of meetings. Um, but also we have an online questionnaire-based offering, which is called Thinking Board, so that you can do a board evaluation through self-assessment. Uh, and often with that, we get involved so that it becomes an externally facilitated review we do the analysis and share our experience with you. Although many of our clients are UK based, um, we do have overseas clients uh, where they are listed in, in the UK, but have overseas operations. We've worked with many international banks and subsidiaries of international banks in the UK. Uh, and recently we have opened two offices in, in Brussels and Dublin to service our overseas clients. And as Phil has just mentioned, we're very much looking forward to having an opportunity to working with clients in the Asia region. And so I've asked Phil to act as our person on the ground in your region. Uh, we're also leading thinkers in, in board effectiveness. And so after this webinar, we'll be sending you some of that thinking. Uh, we have a regular e-bulletin, which, which is free, and we very much welcome you signing up to that. And um, also we've got various checklists covering not only the topics we're going to discuss today, but a number of other aspects of how boards are working during the pandemic. And just the last thing to mention about us, we don't only do board evaluation, we also help with the effectiveness reviews of, for example, the internal audit, the external audit process, risk culture, risk governance. So we look at the effectiveness of the governance framework, but all the time looking from the perspective and the level of the board. So uh, hopefully that gives you a bit of a feel for who independent audits are. So Rem, if you could move on to the next slide, please. So what we're going to do in today's webinar 
is uh, talk about what makes virtual meetings work well. Um, before we do that, what we'd like to do with the participants is just have a quick poll on your experience to date uh, over the last few months of running virtual board meetings. So we're just going to put up on the screen now some qu two questions for you to answer. So if you could answer the first question about which is just asking, how well are your virtual board meetings working? Very well, okay for now, or not well? And now if we move on to the second question, how well are you managing the risks around virtual board meetings? Very well, okay, or, or poorly. And we'll come on to there's some of these issues as we go through the webinar. So if you could all just submit your answers to those two questions, we'll have a quick look at what you're telling us. So Rem, what are the results? So to the first question, it looks like we've got sort of two thirds of people are saying, well, they're working okay for now. And others who are, are, are saying it's going very well. And very good to see that nobody's saying they're not working well at all. Um, so, uh, so that's, that's good to see. And then when in, on this question, managing the risks, I think two thirds of you are satisfied that it's reasonably well managed. Uh, but a few more on this side of things getting a bit concerned that the, the risks aren't being managed. Uh, and just a few saying, yeah, no, we really are on top of it. So that's interesting. Thank you very much for doing that. And what we'll do at the end of the webinar is just ask the same questions and see whether the, how the, uh, that compares uh, once you've heard what we've got to say about uh, good practice for virtual meetings. Thank you for that. So what we're going to do now is go into about 20 minutes of uh, me speaking, sharing experience, uh, what we've seen and what we've heard on what's making virtual meetings work well. And then we will allow approximately 15 minutes for your questions. Uh, please, as we go through at any time, please answer, enter your questions into the Q&A facility on the Zoom toolbar and then we will pick up your questions from there. Very good. So let's, uh, let's look at the sort of issues around webinars. So uh, here's a, one thing just to mention is uh, you, if you uh, know independent audit at all, um, you will see that we use cartoons in a lot of our thought leadership material. Uh, we like to think there might actually be an amusing side to corporate governance. Uh, after 17 or 18 years, I'm not sure whether that's the case. But anyway, we try to see, inject a little bit of humor into the uh, company secretarial world. Um, so, um, but anyway, so you'll see a few cartoons as we go through this presentation. Uh, but just to outline the overall structure of my comments, we'll be discussing uh, how for virtual meetings, a different type of structure might be needed. We'll talk about how you should, how you can try to use the time well. Thirdly, the practicalities, and fourthly, different aspects of chairing virtual meetings. Thanks, Ram. Right. So let's let's first talk about why a different structure might be needed. Now, what we're seeing so far, and over the last few months, we have continued to do board evaluations. And as part of that, we've continued to observe meetings and we've been talking with lots of directors about their experience of virtual meetings. I think over the last three months, we've done about 16 or 17 board evaluations. So we're getting a bit of a picture. And also I will share with you some comments that I, I heard yesterday when I participated in a, a panel with approximately 20 company secretaries from large banking organizations in the UK, and they were sharing their experience. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, include a little bit of that as we go through. But based on what we're seeing and hearing, there's some frustration that what boards, some boards are trying to do is to adopt exactly the same 
structure and approach to meetings and the same schedule for meetings that they used when the meetings were physical in-person meetings. And that just does not work well. Yeah. So you need to really stand back and think, how can we adopt a different schedule and agenda? So part of that is in terms of the, let's say the, the things you should do, first of all, work out the board's role. How does it need to work? How does it need to support management? How does it need to interact with management? Because if you have too many meetings, it's, it, it's very understandable that you, boards want to stay very well informed as to how the organization is responding to the crisis and how performance is being affected. But have too many meetings and it just gets in the way of management who, as we all know, are under considerable pressure. So it's important not to schedule too many meetings and just work out how the board can meet its responsibilities and be supportive without getting in the way of management. So part of that means cutting down the agenda down to essentials and top priorities in order to make sure the meeting is not too long, partly so that it doesn't take up too much management time, but mainly because on a virtual board meeting, it's very difficult for participants to maintain their concentration for as long as they would in a physical meeting. Even in physical meetings, long physical meetings, we all know that's difficult. But it's even more difficult on virtual meetings. So what we're hearing from participants is ideally, you'd keep the, the virtual meeting down to a maximum of around two hours. Now, we know that may not just simply not be possible. Board agendas, committee agendas are very full. So two hours may not be realistic, but what that means is you must have good breaks regularly. Okay, so you need to discuss with the chairman when those breaks are going to happen and allow the time. Build that into the agenda. So, for example, a break every hour and a half as a, a most uh, is what's needed, much more than with physical meetings. And it, it's quite easy for chairman to forget this as they go through the meeting. Uh, I was observing a board meeting last week where it started well. The first part of the meeting had regular sessions. The second part became a four hour marathon with no breaks. And it really did make the meeting much more difficult for participants. You could see them getting tired. You could see the participation dropping and the frustration levels rising. So go for the breaks. The second thing, stakeholder focus on the agenda. And it needs to be a bit of a different structure. So as we all know, the role of corporates during the pandemic is, has been crucial in terms of how they interact with customers, suppliers, their, their employees. And these are topics which don't naturally find their way onto the board agenda, even though they should. But now during the pandemic, they need to be right at the top of agenda, how the organization is interacting with these stakeholders. Also try and limit the agenda by taking certain things off the agenda if they can be dealt with in a different way. This is one of the things I was hearing yesterday from this group, that actually by rigorous examination of the agenda, they had found various items which they did not actually need to be discussed in the board meeting itself and could be taken off and dealt with in a different way. So look at your agendas to see whether that's an opportunity to remove, um, to, to limit the agenda. And also look at the scheduling of your meetings. As you know, often when people are flying in or meeting up physically, it's con the schedule is constrained by the need to fit committee meetings and board meetings into one or two days in order to accommodate travel arrangements. That no longer applies. So now you've got a bit of flexibility in order to perhaps to separate out these meetings so that they are not back to back or continuous meetings. Of course, your directors will still have busy schedules. They will have other board meetings and uh, still carrying on. Other executives will have, of course, other work meetings. But because of the, you know, the lack of travel required, there is a degree of flexibility. So try and introduce some separation. 
Um, also, uh, I've mentioned breaks, but one key thing which is becoming very apparent to us, and again, it was mentioned by this group yesterday, is the vital importance of building in some time for casual, small, informal catch-up uh, discussions. Obviously, one of the big benefits of meeting in person is that directors will have a discussion just outside of the formal meeting, be it over lunch, over coffee breaks, before the meeting, after the meeting. And those informal discussions are very, very important in a board working effectively. So it's important to create opportunities. For example, I even heard that um, one bank has uh, introduced weekly informal coffee or, or wine sessions on a, uh, one evening a week, early evening a week, just to enable the directors to have that sort of informal interaction. So we would strongly suggest you discuss with your chair how you might introduce some element of uh, informal interaction between the formal board meetings or around the formal board meetings to enable that sort of casual discussion to take place. So in terms of adopting a different structure, I hope that's helpful. Uh, here's one cartoon we came up recently. When we came across boards that are taking, still trying to do six, seven, eight hour board meetings on Zoom, Teams, whichever, WebEx, whatever you're using. No, that is just too much of an ask. So uh, we would strongly recommend you avoid that. So Rem, what's next? So obviously if you're having to have shorter meetings, well hopefully that's the case, um, it does mean you need to use the time very effectively. But what we've seen is that often the management participants are not being briefed effectively on how to use, that, use the time differently in virtual board meetings. So what we're still seeing is a lot of time being used up by management making presentations in the same way that they did before. You must as a, a try to avoid that. And um, even before, it's something which we strongly advise against uh, in terms of a board working effectively. It's quite difficult to, to control it and manage it and get the balance right because you do want to hear from management. But often too much board time is taken up with management presentation of papers which the directors will already have received in the pre-read. So something to avoid anyway, but even more so on virtual meetings. You have shorter time it's mu and it's much more difficult for participants to listen to a 15, 20 minute slide based presentation from management when that's happening online in a virtual meeting. So management needs to be told, please, you've got three or four minutes maximum for headlines. Do not try and do any more than that. Okay, so that's a really crucial issue. Secondly, make sure the pre-read papers are adapted to the fact that this is a virtual meeting and it needs to be very focused as a meeting and the discussion needs to be very focused and on point. And in order to achieve that, the pre-read papers similarly need to be focused and on point. Now, these suggestions apply anyway to board papers. This is what you should be doing in any case, but I emphasize in a virtual meeting, it's even more important. So this actually gives you an opportunity to drive some of the changes that you would like to see in your board papers anyway. Changes such as making sure there's what we call good positioning of the issue in very effective summaries of two or three pages. So that directors know what are the issues they actually need to discuss. What are the risks they need to consider? What are they actually trying to achieve? Why is this issue being brought to the board? What are management concerns? So these things should all be extremely clear in those in summaries. And so then in the virtual board meeting, the board can direct its time and attention very quickly to those points. And in terms of signposting from those summary points, the detail, again, what we mean by that is, 
have the short summary, the two or three pages. If you need to refer to detail, do so by signposting it into another part of the paper so that mem board members don't feel they have to go, go through all the detail beforehand. And this is particularly important in financial institutions where the regulators expect a lot of detail to be included, um, but that can often be to the detriment of directors quickly understanding the points to be discussed. Um, also, it's important to identify what matters, what, you know, so that you can go straight to the issue. So this is all about precision, prioritization, and practicality, because boards on virtual board meetings, especially virtual committee meetings, they don't have the time to go through a lot of detail, a lot of unclear issues and to extract the points themselves during the meeting. It just doesn't work as well. So the next point I just want to make to point out, it's important to have the right people in the room um, so that the risks are, are actually covered. Uh, obviously there are different risk management and control issues in this sort of pandemic, work from home, critical operations environment. And so it's no use having the risk the chief risk officer sitting outside the room or not even involved at all in the, in the meeting. Um, and not, and the board is not unable to hear from him or her about how the risk environment is changing and what the organization is doing to mitigate those risks. Also, there's growing legal risks. I mean, just in terms of um, the legal exposures, maybe from customers, suppliers, or maybe even employees around welfare issues, which need to be taken into account. And also the fiduciary responsibilities of directors still, of course, have to be met. That might be around making sure meetings remain quiet, where there's voting takes place in resolutions, where the resolutions are properly approved. All these things need to still happen, of course. You know this as company secretaries. It, they, of course, they still have to happen. But virtual meetings and some technological different complications can just make that a little bit more difficult and you need to keep on top of it. Um, other issues really make sure that you've got the right people in the room to discuss health and safety, employee, customer, supplier, welfare in the pandemic environment. We're all very conscious of those health, safety, welfare issues, but is the board actually in a position to discuss them with the people who really know what is happening and what the risks will be going forward. And then also just who's in the room to discuss the investor, government and regulator expectations. Obviously, all of those bodies are have changing expectations. They recognize things are actually different in this pandemic environment. But are you actually hearing directly from the people who know where how those expectations are changing? So just a few thoughts there in terms of who you actually involve in board meeting discussions, obviously inviting them in on an item by item basis. So using the time well is crucial. So let's move on to the next area. This is around the actual practicalities of the meeting. And we're seeing very mixed experience here. Um, you know, it, I think it's, it sounds obvious to say, don't assume it will just happen and go smoothly. Uh, but we are seeing cases where companies are not preparing well enough for a virtual technology-based meeting. They are just expecting it to go smoothly. And we all know technology doesn't work like that. So things to do, test the system and crucially, each participant's technology. I emphasize the last point because, as again, as we all have experienced over the last few months, some people, some individuals find it more difficult than others, either because in terms of their familiar, familiarity with the technology or connectivity questions at home, that sort of issue. So um, it's, it falls to the, the company secretary and the IT function to make sure that ahead of a meeting, this is all as much as you can guarantee that this is all going to work properly. Um, you know, I personally have observed meetings over the last two or three weeks, even now, so two or three months into the virtual meeting environment, where people are still unable to join. They're not able to use video. 
we can't, they can't hear properly or they can't be heard properly. And this really isn't excusable and it should be possible to overcome those sort of barriers through proper uh, practice and testing. Um, just another practical, think through who is where. What I mean by that is what we're starting to see as officers begin to open up is maybe a group of participants being in one location, for example, in, the, in the, a room in the office building with all the other participants joining individually, uh, virtually. And this is not going well because it's upsetting significantly the dynamic of the meeting because you may have a group of executives on mute talking about whatever question is being discussed in the board meeting or whatever question is being raised by the director. And the individuals know that that sort of discussion is taking place. And so it's disrupting the, the dynamic. So what, uh, one thing I heard yesterday was that actually a, a, a board meeting had started that way but actually after 10 or 15 minutes, each of the executives who were sitting in one room in the head office, then went back to their own individual offices and joined the meeting online as individuals from their laptops, because it had been proved to be so disruptive to the meeting. And I actually observed this in a meeting last week. Um, so it is very careful thinking through if you are going to move to a hybrid type meeting with some people online and others not. Just the next point, I'm sure you're very familiar with this, making sure the, the meeting is secure at all times, knowing who's there, briefing participants on room security, including during breaks, and logging off uh, when they're not actually in the meeting, uh, for example, if other people have any access to their, meet, their laptop, and just generally there, uh, making sure nobody can overhear and especially if they're in a home or a shared accommodation environment, just being ultra cautious. Um, if the, just moving on, the present how documents are presented is crucial, uh, making it smooth. There's nothing worse than watching a, a meeting that's taking place and uh, people wanted to show slides and then when time gets wasted or it all starts falling apart. So practice that. One other thing that is, is being identified is it's important for the participants, the directors to have two devices, one where they have the board papers on their portal and another where they are actually participating in the meeting. I think Diligent is now moving towards a sort of possibly a split screen type structure, but that's really difficult. I mean, even with split screen, it's very difficult for people to read the papers at the same time. Um, so look at how that is working for each individual director. And then just lastly, you know, set the rules, the ground rules, the etiquette of the meeting, making sure that people are encouraged to go on video, but then just have the option not to. Uh, if they technologically can, they should. It is, makes a huge difference to the, to the dynamic of the meeting. Uh, but also, they need, obviously, people need to understand that they should go on mute um, when they're not speaking. Uh, just set the rules for how people actually can intervene. Generally, we see it working well. Generally, people are able to comment, participate in the same way that they would in a physical meeting, but they might need, if they are not uh, finding it easy, they might just need to raise hands and the chair needs to be aware of that, that sort of rule. Um, you know, help people understand how to speak to the camera. If you see them struggling, um, the company secretary should perhaps give them a, a bit of gentle guidance. I observed a meeting last week where the uh, audit committee chairman, the back of the audit committee chairman's head was visible to the board for most of the meeting. Uh, he, rather than speaking to camera, he spoke looking down. And so we all saw the top of his head for quite a long period of time. So that was not ideal. So, and then just get, encourage people to join early. So it's just some practical tips there. So Remy, if we could just move into the last area. And we'll just pause for the, for the cartoon. But then uh, last area is chairing, okay? We have noticed that chairs, some chairs have understood this very quickly. Others uh, are still not adapting to a virtual meeting. So the company secretary might need to give some gentle guidance to the chair 
as to how to chair in a different way. So work out the tactics with the chair and help him or her understand how they might need to just be a bit different, observe things in a different way, invite people in a different way. Uh, one aspect is keeping the time tight and making the breaks happen. That's what I've already mentioned. Um, but also you know, the company secretary, of course, needs to be helping the chairman uh, watch carefully for somebody. It, maybe they can be uh, on chat or on WhatsApp, just WhatsApping the, the chair if they see somebody struggling to participate in the way they wish. You know, it's difficult for a chair to chair a meeting and also keep an eye on all of that. So the company secretary can perhaps help the chair, I say through, through WhatsApp prompts or other chat mechanisms to, uh, to do that. Um, so um, you, the chair may well need to just actively call on people specifically for comments, much more so than a physical meeting. You know, the physical signs just aren't there in the same way. So they may need to just uh, call on individuals more. Uh, but also we're noticing it's much more important to summarize very clearly the conclusion and the actions. Um, again, so people who are listening in a different way can hear that clearly. Again, the physical signs are missing, so it's more difficult for people. So I'm going to stop there. Um, if you just, um, we will be sending you copies of these slides with our contact details on them. But what I'd like to do now is um, just go to the, the questions that we've received uh, and try to, uh, as best I can, answer some of those. Right, so we've got a question coming in saying, um, you know, what is the optimal length of a virtual board meeting? Um, so I mentioned earlier, we, we aim for two hours, uh, but I, we recognize that that may well be just unrealistic, uh, particularly in regulated entities. So I, all I can do is just repeat the advice you gave earlier, that uh, it's best to limit it as much as you possibly can, but, uh, and, and, and use the techniques we've described of more focused agendas, more focused discussion, more focused papers, taking some things off the agenda to try and get it down to as short as possible. But even then, make sure you have the breaks. Okay, another, another question coming in here is, um, do, should boards move back to a physical in-person meeting as soon as possible? Um, well, the, the, the emphasis, of course, has to be as soon as possible. I mean, of course, we all understand it's going to be very complicated, especially where we have directors coming in from different locations in different countries. Um, and so, of course, we're just going to have to wait and see as to what the timing might be on that. Um, the, the group I was talking with yesterday, the general feeling was we're a long time from that, some months away from physical meetings. Uh, and until a vaccine is, a proven vaccine is available, there's going to be a reluctance to, to go back to physical meetings. Um, that was the feeling amongst that group. Um, should they even, so let's, let's assume though that um, physical meetings are possible. Should boards switch back to them? I think what we're hearing is that boards are actually Quite happy with, actually, with, the, with the experience of virtual board meetings if they've made some adjustments and they've got them working well. So there's a reluctance to move back to fully in-person physical meetings. So what we expect to see is a mixture. People recognize that there are a lot of benefits to physical meetings, uh, but that doesn't have to be the case. They, it doesn't have to be a physical meeting all of the time. So what we're expecting to see is possibly alternate meetings so if a board has six or seven meetings a year, maybe two or three of those will be physical plus a strategy today, and the two and two or three will be virtual meetings. So that's what we would expect to see. Um, so uh, obviously there'll be different factors, different cultural considerations, different organizational culture considerations, which are going to mean that it's going to be uh, quite differing practice, I think, for a long time. 
Uh, again, I was hearing yesterday there was one uh, organization where the chief executive is pushing for physical uh, executive meetings uh, at the earliest opportunity. Um, I'm not saying that's right or wrong, uh, but it just indicates that, that in that organization there's obviously a particular culture that will uh, need to be factored in, which may not be there in another organization. So each organization is just going to have to make uh, those, those decisions as and when. Right, what other question? Um, let's, uh, let me start, bear with me a second whilst so I just got, uh, pick those up. Two questions come in. Um, I think one of them is, is, is very relevant. How are boards doing board effectiveness reviews during the pandemic? Do they still have to do them uh, if face-to-face -face interviews aren't possible? Okay. Um, We've been actually, as board evaluators, we've been quite surprised, actually, um, in a sense that if you go back to March, the beginning of lockdown, we expected a hiatus, so a long pause on board evaluations. Um, and surprisingly, we've not actually seen that. And, and we're seeing quite a lot of requests come through. Uh, obviously, some are postponing what they were planning and putting it later in the year. Uh, but generally, we're still seeing people expecting themselves to meet their requirements to do a board evaluation. Um, so partly that's because we're finding that certainly in the UK, the regulators are not allowing much flexibility around this. I mean, I'm sure they will be understanding in relation to the timing. So if some of these board evaluations slip a bit in terms of timing, but they recognize that the way the board is working through the crisis and coming out of the crisis is crucial to the, the future of the organization. So they don't want boards just to stop looking at how well they're working. If anything, they're encouraging them even more to make sure those board evaluations are happening. Now, so that's, that's sort of the regulated scene. For others, um, we just, I suppose what we're seeing is a, a, an, a keenness, an anxiety amongst boards to try to get back to business as usual. And if business as usual meant that they're doing a board evaluation this year, then what they're going to try to do is, is do one. So how is that actually happening in practice? Well, what we're finding is the, the, the reviews that we used to do, uh, well, the reviews which include interviews, and observation of meetings, possibly. Um, we used to do those as much as possible face-to-face, -face with face-to-face with -face interviews. Clearly that's not possible. So all of the interviews are now taking place online, as virtual interviews, and we're finding that works, it's working well. People are just so used to having that sort of meeting now that, um, yeah, it's working. It's not as, it's not as effective, let's, let's be honest. Um, and it's more difficult to actually get a bit of uh, a sort of relationship going in the, in the discussion, but it, it's working fine. So we're doing our interviews virtually. And also, uh, the, if we do do observation meetings, and I know in the Asian environment, the idea of observing meetings is possibly quite advanced. And it, it's now normal in the UK, uh, but I appreciate that in other uh, environments, that may well not be the case. But where we are doing them, we're just joining meetings in the same way as everybody else and observing the virtual meeting. Uh, and so, of course, we still get to see how the board is discussing things, how it's organized, how time is used, the agenda focus, uh, how individuals participate, the dynamics. It's all still obvious in a, in a virtual meeting. So, uh, so that's what we're doing. So the body evaluations are still continuing if they're interview based. Um, but also, because we have the, the questionnaire-based online tool, Thinking Board, which is a, a sort of a quicker and cheaper option, uh, an easier option for some, so it's self-assessment through online questionnaires. Uh, obviously, that also, of course, appeals to, to people at the moment, uh, partly because of, they're maybe a bit reluctant about doing interviews um, virtually, um, but also maybe there's cost pressures meaning that they're looking for something which is a bit more cost effective at this particular point in time. Um, so the answer to that question is, 
they're still going ahead. Um, just people are doing perhaps a little bit later or perhaps just doing them in a bit of a different way. Um, but no, it's uh, fortunately, <laughs> it's business as usual. Um, so that's, that's good. And it's good to see boards well. responding in that way. Okay, and I think there was another question about, uh, there was another question about, a, a sort of, shall we say, an over-enthusiastic director who's taking a lot of time, uh, or spending a lot of time to trying to manage the company, get, get deeply involved with the management of the company. Uh, and sort of the management is spending more time on that board matters than they would normally uh, want to do or should be doing. How do you sort of, in these times when they, the, the director's obviously thinking that their expertise can help so much and get really involved, aren't I doing a good job? Gently tell them, please don't. Yes. Yeah, it's, um, it's tricky, isn't it? It's, it's getting the balance right because you know that they're wanting to help and you know they probably do, most likely do have the expertise that is actually very helpful. Um, but we all also know the management are under a huge stress operational pressures uh, and it, it can be unhelpful if uh, you've got that over enthusiastic uh, non-executive director so i would suggest there's, there's two or three things you could, that could be done one is first of all the chair needs to um, perhaps just have that brought to his or her attention and have a have a quiet word with the director to see what can uh, how the balance can best be struck uh, but also it's important for the chair to be communicating with the chief executive or possibly the executive concern, the CFA or somebody on the ops side, just to understand what the issue is. Is it a question of <clears throat> this person getting in the way? Is it the style of, of advice sometimes? Is it too commanding? Uh, is, he trying to, is that person, that director, trying to second guess management, give alternative messages and really understand what the issue might be in that. So that connection, that discussion between the chair and the executive is, is very important. Uh, but thirdly, it just comes back to a point I raised right at the beginning, just the board discussing what its role is in a crisis situation and how that might evolve over the next few months and have that open discussion with the executive members of the board saying, how would you, dear executive, how would you like the board to help in this? You know, we have experience, we have insight, we have ideas. How is it best to help you in that way without getting in your way? And make sure that the chief executive is aligned with the approach being taken. And just creating that opportunity for that discussion in the board with the executives present gives that opportunity for any of the concerns around this to be aired, uh, brought to the surface before they become a problem. Okay, well, one, uh, one last, oh, yes, so there's one last question just come in. Um, so in terms of the, the chairing, this is again about how a chair needs to adapt his or her style to the meetings. We did touch on this um, during the, the, the webinar, but, and I, but I think it's, it's, rather than repeat those points, what I would say is, is it very important for the company secretary to play a central role here? Now you, as experienced company secretaries, can see when things maybe are not working well. Maybe can see where the, the chair is not chairing the meeting as effectively as is necessary for a virtual meeting. Or you, you pick up comments from participants. Um, and often non-executive, other non-executives don't feel they're in the right position to make a comment, comment to the chair on how he or she is chairing a meeting. It can be a bit tricky. Whereas the company secretary is in a good position to do that. You know, you're going to have, hopefully, a good positive working relationship with the chair. So can introduce things in a gentle way. And one of the skills of a company secretary is the diplomacy that is required in these situations. So you're well positioned to do it. And the only other tip I would add is, it's not directly about the, the chairing style, but allowing time at the end of the meeting to actually ask the participants how it went. What do they feel? Did they, so did they have organizational, practical, technological problems? Did they feel they could participate in the same way? Was the time used in the way that they felt it should be? 
all sorts of different aspects. You just ask people. All it needs is five minutes at the end of the, the meeting to say, before everybody logs off, before everybody leaves the meeting, let's just have a chat. How do we feel that went? Could we do anything differently to make it work better? So I mean, that's uh, really important. And, it, and uh, to remembering to do that and reminding the chair to have that sort of opportunity at the end of the meeting is, is important. So that's another practical tip from us. Um, I'm just checking that we've, we've covered all of the, the questions. Um, so what we'll do is we'll thank you very much for all of you for participating. I hope that was useful and I hope that was practical. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we'll send you some uh, checklist information to uh, help you, you follow up on some of this. Um, and do please contact us. We'll provide you with contact details. Um, we've, Phil, why don't you uh, close off? We've got another webinar coming up. You'd like to mention that and, and just uh, wrap up the session for us. Sure. Thank you very much, Richard. And thank you for everybody who joined the webinar. Uh, I hope you found it useful. I, I, I think it was, personally. Uh, our next webinar is scheduled for the Wednesday, the 15th of July, uh, at the same time, 4 p.m. Hong Kong, in Hong Kong, Singapore, and Malaysia. So please register for that. Uh, in the meantime, if you would like to discuss your board evaluation options uh, or book a demo of our online tool thinking board, please contact me. I think the, the contact details will be sent to everybody. Um, I am based in Hong Kong, so I'm happy to chat, uh, probably virtually, uh, such, as, such as life. Uh, and we can talk about how we can perhaps help your board and committee evaluation and, as, as Richard mentioned, our other services that we offer. So I look forward to meeting everyone again on the 15th and perhaps hopefully uh, before then virtually. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you again for participation and uh, stay safe. <laughs>